that they are the head and not the tail. I thank you, God, that anything that decree in the earth will be established. I thank you that the generations will hear. And because you knew I was the woman for the job, you sent me some backup in the spirit realm. God, I thank you that you are a way maker. I thank you that you are a provider. I thank you that you are Jehovah Jireh. And I decree and declare that any distraction from the enemy is rendered null and void right now in the name of Jesus. I thank you that no weapon formed against this moment will prosper. I thank you that this is a generation of people who are about to shake things up for their country. And I thank you, God, that when they get finished shaking it up, that it will not be unshaken. I thank you, God, that there is an establishing coming that cannot be undone. Can you hear me? House on the Rock, can you hear me? Let me tell you, me and all 46% of my Nigerian is glad to be in the building. What a privilege it is to serve you all. I um, was praying and asking God to just bring me into alignment with what he's already decided to do in this room. I believe that God has given me a word that is going to bless you tremendously, but it would be remiss of me to not take the time to acknowledge Pastor Paul and Pastor Efine. Thank you so much for the absolute pleasure and privilege of serving this house. I have to tell you, Pastor Paul, when we were coming in, my father told me that many years ago he came to this land. And when he came to this land, you brought him here and it was nothing but land and you told him that you were gonna build this church. And I am just crazy enough to believe that not only did you build an edifice, but that you built a people who are gonna rise up and change this nation. And so Pastor Paul, Pastor Fine, thank you so much for the gift of God that rests on side of you. I've been growing up hearing about them my entire life, and so to have the opportunity to come here, honestly, it is full circle. My father, my bishop, Bishop T.D. Jakes, my daddy, who gave me a sense of identity regardless of what the culture said and made it his mission to bring me back home. Thank you for standing on the wall and bringing me back here. I love you tremendously. Now, you know I'm finna say something about my man. <laughs> he just too good to me, you know? Child, I was up there doing breathing exercise because I am stressed right now. And because uh, you all are so classy and dignified and I love that, but you know, I'm just a, a half Niger girl from America and... Uh, <laughs> Have Nadja girl from America? Nadja know they finished last, what? I've been studying. And my husband took my hand and prayed over me and reminded me and anchored me in my identity in God and the d unique anointing that is assigned to this moment. And so honey, I thank you for your constant covering and love over me. Good job. I didn't even know the delegation was in Nigeria. They told me they were here. Hey, y'all. Hey. Ciao. They done got us in it now. <laughs> I wish a weapon would. Luke 23. I love you too. Luke 23, verse 32 through 35. Is one of these gonna help me sing like the worship team? No. Okay. This moment in the text, Jesus is headed to the cross to be put to death. I only have three verses to share with you from this moment, but I believe that it will help you as it has served me well. If I had to take a subject, it would be blinded by potential. Luke 23 verse 32 begins and I'm reading from the New King James Version. It says there were also two other criminals led with him to be put to death. 
And when they had come to the place called Calvary, there they crucified him. And the criminals, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Then Jesus said, forgive them. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. And they divided his garments and cast lots, and the people stood looking on. But even the rulers with their sneer saying, he saved others, let him save himself if he is the Christ, the chosen of God. Spirit of the living God, you have ordered my steps. And here we stand. God, speak. Do the thing that only you can do when you have decided an encounter must happen. I thank you, God, for the gift of wisdom, of revelation, of prophecy, of insight. I thank you, God, that there is nothing in the spirit that is withheld from me in this moment. So my prayer is that no fear, no nerves, no anxiety would stand in the way of what you have decided to do. I am but a girl, but you, Father, when you use my lips, when you use my heart, lives are changed. Breathe on this word as only you can do. Make space inside of them that they may receive all that is in this word for them and then seal it. Let it take root and produce fruit. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You guys can be seated. I've been studying a new form of science that is beginning to emerge and it's called epigenics. Epigenics is the study of how our environment affects our genes. It has the ability to affect our genes. Epigenics is really doing a deep dive into the matter of nurture versus nature. Instead of it being one or the other, Epigenics suggests that it is a combination of them all and that depending on the environment, it determines what gene will be expressed inside of us. So if a family has high blood pressure and high cholesterol, that is having some type of genetic connection, some genetic predisposition, but also there is something environmentally that allows that gene to be expressed. If they were raised in a different environment, perhaps that would not be their reality, but the environment and their genes come together and activate an outcome. That means that had I been raised in a household where maybe I was told that I had a beautiful voice and could sing like an angel, that I would be up here singing with the worship team. But I guess that gene was not able to be activated in my life. And so now here I am preaching because the environment in which I was raised allowed for that gene to be activated because of environment. I don't think that this is any secret to those of us, though, who recognize the role that environment plays in forming who we are. Even now in our spirituality, scripture lets us see that before God placed Adam and Eve in the garden, man and woman in the garden, that he first created an environment for them. He creates an environment for them because if he just places them while things are still being structured, it will not bring out the best version of who they are. And because he recognized that he was going to give them an assignment, that assignment had to be directly connected to the environment in which they were placed. Let's say, for instance, that he does not place them in an environment and then he says to them to be fruitful and multiply and to fill the earth. They would have looked around and said, my environment is not conducive to the mandate in which you have given me. God, however... And his infinite wisdom recognizes that the environment that I'm going to place them in, though it may not make sense to them when I say these words, the environment is designed to help them take the word that I am giving them and bring it to life. Wish I could say that better. Sometimes God gives you a mandate, he gives you a purpose, he gives you a vision of what is possible, and yet because of the environment you are placed in, you think to yourself, this environment cannot possibly birth this thing that God has given me, not recognizing that God didn't give you the word until the environment was ready for you to manifest that word. A lot of times we look at what God did, but not how God did it. 
God didn't just place them in the garden. He didn't just create the environment for them. He spoke a word and that word produced the environment. He said, let there be light. And there was light. And our problem is that we spend so much time focusing on what he did that we miss out on how he did it because what I see when I look at how he did it is that the word itself created an environment. That means when God gives me a word, God's not just giving me something to think about. He's not just giving me something that I can tuck into a folder and think about later. When God gives me a word, God is offering me an opportunity at a new environment. So when we say that Africa hasn't seen its best days yet, we could say, hey, we've heard that before, or we could allow that word to produce an environment and that environment to activate the gene that allows us to be a part of what God wants to see happen in the earth. His word creates an environment. That's why when we come into spaces like this and we receive the word, the depression and the anxiety and the frustrations and the disgust, it all goes away because in this environment, the word is more powerful than the lesser words that have been dragging you down. And the enemy knows that in order for him to undo the environment that the word created, he just has to speak a word that disrupts the environment. Genesis 3, the serpent doesn't just hand her the fruit and say, eat it. He speaks a word that changes the environment, her perception of how she sees God. So now suddenly the God that I thought was good, suddenly the God that I thought was for me, suddenly the God that I thought created an atmosphere for me to flourish is now the God I can no longer trust. The word of the enemy shifted everything too. This where woman evolve. I would take a minute and I would tell you how just when the enemy thought he won, that God spoke another one, another word specifically to the woman. And he says this other word about the woman because he recognizes that the woman is now going to go through a series of oppressions, a series of being disregarded because she was once the gateway that allowed sin to enter the world. But because God understands that I have a plan to restore the woman, I'm going to create an environment for her with a word that she doesn't even realize is hanging over her life because this will be the word that allows her to know that I am not finished with the woman yet though this happened to the woman though this happened through the woman I'm also going to make sure that restoration happens through the woman as well Genesis 3 and 15 lets us know that it is the woman who will carry the seed of God and that seed of God will then go on to crush the head of the serpent that means that though it started with a woman it's also going to end with a woman I'm going to take the very woman that was once ridiculed and oppressed and use her to bring about restoration Africa I want you to know that what's going to happen in this nation is not just going to be a job for a man and it's not just going to be a job for a woman it's going to take both of us taking our position and moving with power and authority in a very droll type of way that in my last days I'm going to pour out my spirit on all flesh and my sons and my daughters are going to prophesy when the woman unleashes her tongue I want you to know that that's when hell is really going to get nervous because we now got two people talking back to the devil about what can or cannot happen in this generation the man is a part of the generation for sure but when a man and a woman who create generation come together and say it cannot happen on my watch now we are a force field against the enemy I know this may not be the place but I am the one to tell you woman that when you take your place that demons start trembling I know it's not woman evolved but I gotta take a minute and talk to the women and let you know that you have been ordained to be a part of the fight this is not just a job for the men God says I put oil on you too I put anointing on you too I put glory on you too and a man needs to take a break every now and then and when a man takes a break he's got to know that there's a woman who's willing to push a devil back baby you ain't never seen prayer until you seen a woman praying over her children's children baby you ain't never seen prayer for a nation until you see a woman deciding that this country shall be saved my family shall be saved you have never seen cancer rebuke until you've seen a woman who has decided it cannot happen on my watch 
Women make some noise in this place. Women make some noise in this place. Women make some noise in this place. Like you recognize that you carry glory too. Like you recognize that God put oil on you too. Like you recognize that no weapon formed against you will prosper. And that you gotta take your place too. Make some noise in this place. I wanna hear what it sounds like when a woman unleashes her tongue. I wanna hear what it sounds like when a woman says, if you're looking for a mouth to prophesy, use my lips. If you're looking for somebody to decree a thing in the earth, use my mouth, women. The environment can't shift until we have a collective sound. We can't back the enemy up until we have a collective sound. And we need the voices of each gender to fully engage with the war necessary to reclaim our territory. I'll tell you this, that the same serpent that attempted to create a different environment by undermining what God said, recognizes that though this story is still gonna play out, that in order to intercept the plan that has been set in motion, that he will have to prohibit creation from coming to the realization that God spoke a word, the serpent spoke a word, but it's not until they speak a word that the journey can really kick off. That's why in Genesis 4, it makes a point to let us know that Seth's son Enosh, once he is born, that that generation begins to call upon the name of the Lord again. Now all of a sudden, where there was once a war between environments, the environment that God created and the environment that the serpent created because Seth's son Enosh calls on the name of the Lord. Now he's got a compass to help him navigate the war between the environments. When we call upon the name of the Lord, when we open our hearts up for worship, it allows him access to help guide and order us between the war of environments that we exist in. We exist in between a war of environments. On one hand, I do need to engage in politics to make change, but the war of environments is that I wanna do good and I have to stay away from corruption. The war of environments of me doing something different that my family has never seen done before, but me also staying connected to this family, I'm navigating a war of environments. And in order for me to do so successfully, I cannot do it in my own might. I cannot do it in my own power. I cannot do it with my own wisdom. I have to call upon the name of the Lord because when I call upon the name of the Lord, he helps me to understand how to navigate the war of environments. This text was particularly intriguing to me because it speaks to God's ability to help us understand the environments that we are warring against and being sensitive enough to be led. From this point in Genesis 4 in scripture, we see that God begins to download to particular servant strategies on how to navigate different environments. He says to Abraham, get out of your father's house to a land that I will show you. Get out of this environment and move into that environment. He says to Moses and Midian, you've been in Midian too long. I'm not finished with you in Egypt. You've got to go back there. You got to move out of this environment into that environment because this environment that you are currently in is not designed to help you activate the gene, to activate the leadership, to activate the redemption, to activate the deliverance that is connected to who you are. And so God is constantly giving us downloads on which environment is best suited to help us birth our purpose. That's why I am in relationship with God and not just a religion girl. Because I recognize that if I were just a religion girl, I would have got saved, checked that box, and went to live in any kind of way. But I am a relationship girl who recognizes that my primary goal on earth is to establish the kingdom of heaven. And if my goal is to establish the kingdom of heaven, I cannot establish my kingdom and call it heaven. I have to seek you first, the kingdom of God. 
because when I seek the kingdom of God, it allows me to understand what establishing the kingdom of heaven looks like with my gifts, with my talents in my region, with what God has given me. I have to seek out God so that I can move with wisdom and strategy and precision because I do not have time to miss. I have missed already too many times in my life. And this is a season where I recognize that precision is everything. Precision is everything for you. You have to have strategy. We cannot do random. We got a real devil to fight. We got a real war to win. We got a real generation to save. And we cannot lollygag and be random and be distracted by what is happening in the culture when we have been called to introduce a new culture. If I am so busy complaining that I am not changing anything, then I am just as much responsible for the outcomes that I am frustrated with. But when I make it my responsibility to say, God, if you are allowing me to see it, help me to understand the role I play in being a solution because I am a citizen of your kingdom and I move at your command and I speak what you tell me to speak and I go where you tell me to go. And because I do not want to miss and because I am already coming from behind, I recognize that acceleration is only possible through obedience. Everyone wants to accelerate, but very few want to follow with the obedience required for acceleration. But the acceleration is contingent on your obedience. When you move with obedience, God says, I can trust you. And when God says, I can trust you, God says, I can allow you to have favor. And when you have the favor of God, it doesn't matter who your opposition is. It doesn't matter who your enemy is because I'm moving with so much integrity that God has already gone ahead of me and made my crooked path straight. I know you're talking about me, but when I come through the room you'll have to go on mute because God has already ordained me to be in this room I know you don't know what to expect with the book but I hear God saying if you write the book I'll help you get the pages in the hands of the people who need them the most you don't know how to raise the child but you know God gave you the child and if God gave me the child then God's got a strategy for the environment I can create for the child I have to stay connected with God because God is showing me how to move between these environments he's showing me how to move between environments that all almost killed my parents to move in between environments that other generations could not withstand. He's moving somebody in this room into spaces of innovation. He's moving somebody in this room into spaces of technology. You are literally going behind the enemy's camp and you recognize that you're going behind the enemy's camp with a mission and this mission is too big for you. But God says, I am bigger than the mission that is ahead of you. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. If I sent you behind enemy lines. It is not so that you can become them. It is so that you can change them. And when you get finished changing them, they're going to want to know who your God is. You think it's about science. It's not about science. It is about the kingdom. You think it's about technology. It is not about technology. It is about the kingdom. It is not about health care. It is about the kingdom. It is not hospitality. It is about the kingdom. I've got people in this region on assignment to establish the kingdom. And there's going to come a day where all of my undercover officers are revealed in high places. All of my undercover officers are revealed. I didn't know that you was working all along, but the moment you said yes, the moment you walked into the door, God said I had her on assignment. I don't know who you are, but I hear God saying get used to high places. Get used to being in rooms bigger than you. Get used to being in rooms where you gotta learn some things. Get used to being in spaces that don't make sense. I'm calling you into a room so that I can grow the gift of God I placed inside of you. And that's why they had to leave you. And that's why they had to walk away. Because had they stayed, you would have shrunk. But because they got out of the way, they made room for you to be all that God said you could be. What's up, Nigeria? You're about to make me act. There's somebody in this room. And I hear God saying you're about to throw in the towel and God's just about to get started. I hear God saying that I sent a girl all the way from America. I don't have no business being in this room. I'm tired. I got six kids waiting at home. But God told me there's something in this environment. There's someone who needs you to come and activate the gift of God I placed inside of them. If that's you, I want you to take 10 seconds and give God a praise so that he can activate the gift of God that's on the inside of you. Activate, 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 
Activate, activate, activate. I came to put you in position, activate. I came to remind you who you are, activate. I came to remind you that the heavens are backing you up. I came to remind you that there's a hedge of protection around you. I came to remind you that no weapon formed against you will prosper. I came to remind you that though he's slay you, you can still trust him. Cause when he gets finished slaying you, baby, you wanna slay every demon connected to your family. Just let me finish working my will out in your life when I get finished. You see, what happens to us is the same thing that happens in the epigenics. The external environment changes us on the inside before we even know what's happening. So when you experience discouragement and when you experience division and frustration, it changes your environment so subtly that you don't realize that you're no longer activated the way you once were. That you're no longer passionate the way you once were. It happens so suddenly that you don't even realize that it's happened in your heart. It happens so suddenly. You used to be passionate about it. Now you don't understand. I used to think it was possible. Now it's no longer in reach. What happened? That discouragement that was in your environment invaded your heart and now your heart you don't have the heart for it anymore. You don't have the heart for the ministry. You don't have the heart for the marriage. You don't have the heart for the degree. You don't have it. You once had it. What happened? It got hard. It got tough. They started betraying me and I just don't have the heart that I once had for it. Same thing happened to Sarah who once wanted a child in Bible. And then when the angel of the Lord finally says to her, you're going to give birth, she laughs. How did I go from being an expectation to being the one who laughs at the very thing I was praying for? Something infiltrated my inner environment. And because it infiltrated my inner environment, I don't show up with the same heart and the same passion that is required, not negotiable. It is required that you have your heart in this thing because you cannot change anything unless your heart is in it. You cannot withstand the discouragement unless your heart is in it. But I came here to let you know that somebody's getting their heart back. I came here to let you know that God will not leave you on the mission field without taking care of the wounds that have affected your heart. I came here to let you know maybe I brought your heart back with you. Maybe I came to tell you that God can do a heart surgery right here right now in this room that if you would be willing to open up your mouth and to open up your spirit and say God I want my heart back I want my heart for the things of God I want my heart for this purpose I want my heart for my children I want my heart for this ministry God I want it back I want it back I want it back I can't keep living and walking like I don't have a heart anymore I can't keep pretending that it doesn't matter to me anymore and I cannot continue to watch a generation be destroyed and to watch my family system crumble while I sit back and do nothing. I hear God saying everything I'm going to do through the earth, I'm going to do it through you. But I got to do it through your heart. I cannot do it through your intellect. I cannot do it through your connections. I can only do it when your heart is in it. So we have this external environment that we must navigate and it is tricky it is certainly the knowledge of good and evil these environments that we must navigate i can see the good and i can see the evil and i gotta straddle both sides of it and i gotta dip and weave and bob and weave to make sure that i stay strategic but i am telling you your external environment is not nearly as important as navigating your inner environment and doing the work to identify how did doubt, how did worry, how did fear, 
How did anxiety rob me of my depression? How did pride, how did ego make me chase the dollar when I was once chasing change? Help me to understand what happened in my heart where I became afraid. God, help me to understand where the crack is because I recognize that you are a restorer and anywhere there is a crack that you can fill it again. And God, if you fill it again, then maybe I could be used again. And if I could be used again, maybe the promise that you have connected to my name can be established in the earth and so this text is so powerful to me because it shows us not just the compassion of Jesus but the heart of Jesus and these three verses when his external environment is hostile he went from having the luxury of creating his own environment with his disciples to moving into a season of destiny where he can no longer have the luxury of being comfortable. But because he has mastered his inner environment, it doesn't matter how hostile the environment is outside of him because he has mastered the inner environment. I wanna talk to somebody who's got some hostile territory to invade. I want you to know that you do not have to be afraid of the arrows by night, nor do you have to be afraid of the suffering that may come. Because when you have an inner environment that reminds you of the promises of God, when you have an inner environment to help you navigate the hostility, God says, I'll send you behind the enemy's camp so that you could unlock the places where where people like you have been barred. I will send you by, this is not everyone's message. I'm sorry I came all the way here to only talk to a select few, but I, God told me that there are people in this room who he has already ordered for them to go into hostile environments and to turn them around for his glory, to go into hostile environments. And I know that you're tired and I know that you're weary, but maybe I am just here to serve as your reminder that if you don't go behind the enemy's camp that you will leave the rest of us behind if you don't go behind the enemy's camp you will never see why he preserved you I'm not crazy I know who's in this room some of you have no business even being at house on the rock but because God kept pulling you and God kept trusting you and God kept saying it's not over it's not over it's not over you got a second wind to help you kick a few doors down and I came here to let you know that the wind is about to blow again I came here to let you know that the gate is going to be open and it's going to be open because you kicked that bad boy down. This Jesus on the cross who has come out of the garden because he had to master what was coming up in his heart. He felt afraid. There's a point in the cross where he says, Father, Father, why hast thou forsaken me? He felt forsaken. But what he does that we don't do is if it comes up, it came out. It comes up in our heart and we suppress it down. And then we wonder why our heart is sick. And then we wonder why we don't have the passion. And then we wonder why we don't have the will. And we wonder how one little discouragement can knock us out of our course. But something powerful happens when it comes up and out. It makes room for glory. I'm glad you finally admitted it. Because now that you admitted it, I can take it from you. God is such a gentleman that he won't reach in your chest and take it out. But if you would offer it up to him as a living sacrifice. I know we already gave our offering. But somebody else has something else that needs to be laid at the altar. Somebody else has some betrayal that needs to be laid at the altar. Some abandonment that needs to be laid at the altar some rejection that needs to be laid at the altar because it's been in your heart too long and for this next stage of your journey you got to keep your heart clear you got to keep your heart pure because God's got glory connected to that heart and God will not contaminate his glory with your worry God will not contaminate his glory with your fear God will not contaminate his glory with your anxiety so Lord it's me it's me it's me oh God standing in the need of prayer not my mother not my sister but it's me oh God standing in the need of prayer there is an enemy in my chest 
There is an enemy in my head. Now I need this mind that was also in Christ Jesus to also be in me because I want to see what's on the other side of the suffering. He does this work, Jesus, with such eloquence, with such power, that even the very people who are crucifying, he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. How? How did you do that? What did you do in your heart that made you see your enemy as your ministry? What did you do in your heart that made you see your enemy as the very person you're called to? What did you do in your heart? I, I, I love a good sermon about haters, but some of us don't have haters. We just have ministers waiting for us to finally take the call. Some of us just have sheep waiting for us to step into the call. And Jesus is blinded by the potential, not of who they are, but of who they could be. I see you. I could see them as my enemy. I could see them as a threat. I could hold them accountable for all of the ways that they hurt me. But that would contaminate my heart. I could do it. I could. But it would weigh my heart down. And my heart cannot be weighed down in this season. So here we see Jesus stretched wide and hung high looking at the very thing that hurt him saying father if they were who i know they could be they would be so sorry that they are letting this happen but because i am blinded by their potential i'm not asking you to give them what they deserve i'm asking you to help them to become to help them become the kind of person that looks back on this and say i wish i would have never i want you to understand that the very people who hurt you when you get finished being you that they're going to look back and say i wish i would have never ran up on him like that i wish i would have never pissed them in his side i wish i would have never betrayed them i didn't realize that by betraying them, I was actually pushing them into position. That's why this text is crazy to me. Because I, I'm thinking to myself, Jesus, you knew you had to go to the cross. Why are we asking for them to be forgiven? But God is so blinded by the potential of who these people could be that it doesn't even matter that he's going to make it work together for the good. He wants to make sure that anything he touches along the way doesn't just experience his pride. They don't just experience his ego, but that they experience his heart. I ask God why this message. I ask God why this country. I ask God why this season. And God made it clear to me that the only way we do this, the only way we change this country, the only way we change our family systems is if we do the work for our inner environment. So much so that when we look at the devastation and we look at the destruction and we look at the room for there to be change, that we do not become discouraged, but instead we are blinded by potential. Because when we are seeing the potential of what could be, instead of the pain of what it is, we will pray differently. We will walk differently. We will talk differently. The theme of the conference is unshaken. And I struggled a little bit because everything I was receiving in the text, let me know that it is going to be unshaken your heart but the reason your heart must be unshaken is because somebody in this room is about to shake things up and you cannot shake things up with a faulty heart where are my bad people who have the heart to shake things up where are my people who have the heart to change a nation I hear God saying that when you get finished doing this work that you're gonna shake things up for a generation that you're gonna shake things up for your nation get ready get ready get ready get ready get ready Ready. Get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready. Nigeria, get ready. Niger, get ready. Abuja, get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready. 
Somebody's about to shake things up. You're not even going to see them coming. You won't even recognize they're in the right space, that they're in the right environment. Because the work that I'm doing with them, I've been doing in secret. I've been doing in their prayer closet. I've been whispering crazy ideas in their head. I've been making them think that they need medicine. I've been making them think that they are going wild and insane. And I hear God saying, you are not going crazy. I'm giving you downloads for the next dimension. You are not going crazy. You have tapped into a glory that awaits. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the potential for glory. I came here to let you know, yes, Nigeria will be a superpower. Yes, it will be bigger than America. But what it will have more than anything is it will be marked by the glory of God. It will be marked by the promises of God. And every enemy and every demon and every principality that has been assigned to this region, I rebuke it in the name of Jesus. I'm not waiting for it to get out of the way. I'm not waiting for it to not be strong. I'm waiting to get the heart to be strong enough to say I wish cancer would. I wish a disease would. I wish a weapon would. I'm waiting for me and you to get a heart that can carry glory. A heart that can be a channel for glory. A heart that is not easily discouraged. A heart that can put your hand to the plow. A heart that doesn't mind sacrifice in order to get on the other side. A heart that can say, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. But just because they don't know what they're doing, it doesn't mean I don't know what I'm doing. I'm going to stay in position. They don't have to know who I am. I know who I am. And God, when you get finished, they're going to know who you are too. Because I'm not just looking to make my name great. I'm looking for the glory of God to overflow in such a way that they wonder, how could the place that was once cursed... How could this Jesus, who was once so cursed that he was crucified by two criminals, rise with all power in his hand? Maybe, just maybe, he was who he said he was. And he did the work to maintain the heart posture to be who God said he could be. Certainly, it is time for us to shake things up. But most importantly, it is time for us to make sure our heart remains unshaken. Unshaken. I asked God who would be in this room and how I could best serve them. And God let me know that the leaders of the next generation. No, I'm sorry, my apologies. The leaders of this generation. Because so often we're so busy thinking that we're next, that we don't do the work now that positions us for next. You are a now generation. You are a now generation. And that voice that gift, that anointing, that strategy that God has given you, it's real. It's real and it may have never been seen before, it may have never been done before. And compared to what you're up against, it's probably so overwhelming that it's easier to be discouraged than to step into destiny. But I ask God to give me a word that would help you get your heart back in position to feel strength coming back into your heart. And God made it clear to me that none of that can be possible unless we are willing to lay down those enemies, those disappointments, those pains that made us lose heart in the first place. I love scripture. Scripture tells us that God will give us the desires of our hearts. Doesn't mean that God will give you whatever you desire. It means that God will give your heart a desire. I believe 
that in this room God is giving hearts desire that there's an awakening coming to your heart in a way that you don't even know if you can trust because you God I don't know who you are you've been disappointed so many times that you put your heart into it that the very idea of putting your heart back into it again feels like a threat it feels like another opportunity for a heartbreak it feels like another opportunity for betrayal and I hear God saying I know it hurts you I know it hurts you when they betrayed you I know it hurts you when they denied you I know it hurts you when they talked about you I know it hurts you when you got rejected I know it hurts you when you couldn't move the way that you wanted to move but I hear God God saying, I still need you to get your heart together. I still need you to put your heart together because I'm not finished writing the story. I'm not finished telling you what the outcome is going to be. I'm not finished. And if you give up before God gives up, who will God use? Who will God use to shake up the earth? If you give up before God gives up, then maybe somebody else will take the leadership position that you were supposed to be in. And so get back in the game. Wounded heart and all. Get back in position. Failure and all. Get back back in position rejection and all God says if you move I'll heal if you walk I'll talk if you do what is necessary to take your position I'll give you the purpose as you go you don't get the luxury of the full plan but what I will give you is the assurance that I will never leave you nor forsake you what I will give you is the assurance that you will not be in it on your own just as I was with Abraham, just as I was with Isaac, just as I was with Jacob, I will be with you too. Jesus stays on the cross not because it feels good, not because they understood him. Jesus stays on the cross because he could not lose heart at a critical moment where everything would change. I'm almost out of time, but I'm telling you that this moment is just as critical for you as it was for Jesus in the text. This critical moment of transition is the moment in which everything is going to shift. And when everything begins to shift, you'll see why you had to get your heart together. I commend you for coming to lay your heart at the altar because this is the type of begging and pleading where we say, God, not my will, but your will be done. That changes the position that of, of our heart. It, this is the type of posture that says, God, if someone else could do it, please give it to them. But if you're going to choose me to do it, God, help me to understand understand who I need to be to get it done. This altar ought to be flooded with people who recognize that this heart disease is going to move me out of position. But because I am so committed to seeing what glory is connected on the other side of my name, I will humble myself. I will posture myself for God to breathe on me again. For God to take the shattered pieces of my heart and to pull them back together again. God, I want to do something that allows your glory to be seen in the earth. I want to do something that allows my generation to recognize that you did not forget about us. I want to do something that allows resurrecting power to come back. God's going to resurrect joy in your family. God's going to resurrect worship in your family. God's going to resurrect relationship in your family. God's going to resurrect finances in your family. You don't have to believe it. I just need one or two, three crazy people who are crazy enough to believe it because three of us could shift this nation. Three of us could change the outcomes. Three of us could bombard heaven and heaven would respond. When heaven responds, there is a sound that is released in the atmosphere. When heaven responds, there is a worship that is released in the atmosphere. And just as Enosh began to call upon the name of the Lord and the Lord began to respond again, when the people who are humble, who are called by my name, humble themselves and seek my face, there I will begin to shift things again. I know you may have not done what you could have done but the fact that you allowed that enemy in your heart because there's an enemy behind those lines when we repent we say I know I'm not functioning the way I should be functioning I know I'm not moving with the level of integrity that I need to move with. I know I'm not moving with the level of passion connected to this purpose. I see it, God. But you sent a word for me. And this word you sent for me is not just so that I can have a good time at a conference. This word you sent for me was so that my heart 
could experience the transplant it needs for me to walk into your perfect will and plan for my life. We always talk about David being a man after God's own heart. I happen to believe that that was a shift that took place after his heart got displaced. When he was at home instead of at war and his heart allowed him to do things that he should not have done and then to perform murders that should not have been performed. How is this the man who was after God's heart? It's because David had enough wisdom to say, examine my heart. Clean my heart, Lord. And renew a steadfast spirit in me, a steadfast spirit. That sounds like an unshaken spirit. At this altar, as close to it as you can get, I'm asking for those of you who've been dealing with the disruption of your inner environment, disrupted by doubt, disrupted by worry, disrupted by betrayal, that whatever your disruption is, I'm asking you to lay it at this altar. I'm asking you literally to be a living sacrifice that you would lay your heart at the altar. And when you call upon God, that you would ask God to renew a steadfast spirit in you. Because you recognize that you are not just here to take up space. Maybe nobody has told you in a while. Let me be the reminder, you are not a coincidence. You are not a random. You are not here to be used and abused. You are not here to be ignored. You are here to establish the kingdom of heaven. You are a disciple. And as a disciple, you have a mission. But we need a steadfast spirit to get it done. I want to pray with you. I want to pray with those of you who are learning to master an inner environment. I was talking to my friend, Dr. Anita Phillips, and we were talking about the scripture guarding your heart. And oftentimes when we hear this scripture, we think about keeping things out. But when we look at the original translation of this scripture, it talks about guarding your heart because out of it springs the issues of life. Which means that we have to guard it not also because of what can come in, but because we wanna be diligent about what comes out of it. When we guard our heart in such a way that there's something in this heart that I cannot lose, I can't lose this. I can't lose this passion. I can't lose this power. I can't lose this anointing. I can't lose this creativity. Some people are guarding because they don't want things to come in. I'm guarding it because God gave me something and I believe in what God gave me. And anytime I don't leave my heart guarded, then something comes and it snatches it away. But I got to guard my heart to finish this degree. I got to guard my heart to build this family. I got to guard my heart to build this ministry. I got to guard my heart to be in this marriage. I got to keep something inside of my heart. What is it that I'm keeping? I'm keeping assurance, keeping peace, trust. God, I just want to trust you. Mm. I want to trust that this isn't the end. God, I want to trust that all things are working together. God, I want to trust you again. I want to trust that you didn't forget me. I want to trust that you're not ignoring me. I want to trust that you see me. God, I just want to trust you again. I clap my hands. I lift my hands in worship. I go through all of the motions, but nobody knows that I'm having a hard time trusting you with that child. I'm having a hard time trusting you with this business. God, I ask that you would just restore that trust. You're watching online and you're asking God to restore the trust that you lost literally all over the world. Can you imagine what happens when all of us begin to get our heart back all over the world? Surely we would look at one another and say, holy, 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 holy. Can you imagine how the earth would be full of God's glory if we all took our position and got our hearts together? So, Heavenly Father, Spirit of the living God, the God who sees, the God who knows, the God who restores, the God who causes all things to work together. I'm not just talking about any old God. 
I'm talking about the one and only true God. I'm talking about the God who goes ahead of me and makes my crooked path straight. I'm talking about the God who knew that I would have this betrayal before it even happened. I'm talking about the God who understood that I would be in this family before I took my first breath. I'm talking about the God who knew me before he formed me in my mother's womb. I'm talking about the God who set me apart, who sanctified me and anointed me. I'm not talking about any old God. I'm talking about the God who knows the way that I take. I'm talking about the God who teaches my hands to war. I'm talking about the God who has already understood what my great, 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 great 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 grandchildren went through and can still go back and help me understand what my ancestors went through i'm talking about the god who does not live in time i'm talking about the god of my yesterday today and tomorrow i'm talking about the god of my forefathers and the god of those who are to come this is not any ordinary god and god because you do not sit in the realm of time you are not stuck in the ways that we get stuck and because your ways are not our ways, you don't blame us for the ways that we've been showing up. Because man looks at the outward appearance, but God, you look at the heart and you know where they got lost along the way. But you also knew that this moment would occur. So God, I thank you for a divine appointment. I thank you that you went out of your way to get their heart back in position. I thank you, God, that you love them, not because of how they perform, but simply because of who they are. I thank you, God, that because of who you are, you throw our sins into the sea of forgetfulness for your own sake. You don't even keep a record of our wrongs. So God, while we're keeping tabs, you're just waiting for us to say yes. This is our yes. We say yes to your will. We say yes to your way. We say yes to your path. We say yes to your purpose. We say yes to this job. We say yes to this family. We say yes to this environment. We say yes to where you have positioned us because we recognize that we do not have the permission to move until the inner environment is healthy enough to move to the next with strategy. God, I thank you for every gift, every talent, every soul represented at this altar. Thank you, God, for preserving them. Thank you, God, for giving them wisdom and strategy. Thank you, God, for knowing what would happen before it even took place. God, I pray that as they have this moment of surrender, that they would experience a radical encounter with you, not just now, but for the years to come that they would consult you before making decisions, that they would consult you as they go into different spaces and industries, God, that they would seek your face. And God, I thank you that you will reveal yourself to them. God, open their eyes that they will not miss the moment when you have revealed yourself to them. And God, I thank you that you will not just stop at revealing yourself to them, but that you will reflect yourself in them. And everywhere they go, that you will go with them, that they will bear the image of you, God, because they have opened themselves up to no longer have the image of that betrayal or the image of that abandonment we relinquish right here at this altar any other name that has been exalted over your name and we lay it down we lay down the heartbreak we lay down the depression we lay down the sorcery we lay it down right now in the name of Jesus and we say we lift you up Jesus we lift you up Jesus we lift you up I plead the blood of Jesus over them and when that blood is over them God I recognize that nothing can cut through the blood I recognize that nothing can get through the blood so allow your blood to cover them like never before and as your blood covers them let it guide them let it cleanse them no condemnation no shame no more shrinking God called their people to them subtract from them those who wish them harm and open their eyes that they won't miss the moment where you haven't just restored them, but you've given them a hope and a future. Thank you, God, for this moment. Thank you, God, for this church. Thank you, God, for these people. Thank you for always showing up. In Jesus' name, I pray.